Welcome to my channel, Mispronounced Adventures. My name's Alex, and welcome to a heater video. On this channel, I talk about heaters a lot. What's a heater? For the heat, I said heaters. Heater. Leave the heating on. I did turn the heating on in the van about an hour ago. The reason why I talk about heaters a lot is I spend my winter seasons in this van, living up in the Nordic Arctic. And funny enough, it's quite cold. Minus 31. So keeping warm is pretty important. And I'm uh, a bit cold. As I like technical projects, I like taking things apart and learning about them, I've looked at and reviewed in the past quite a lot of different styles of diesel heaters, from the very popular and value for money Chinese made diesel heaters, the air ones and the hydronic ones as well as some Wabasto engine preheaters, which keeps the van's engine warm in the Arctic. Preheater on. That's the engine. And the engine preheater on. However, this video is a bit different. I've managed to get hold of an Autotherm, which is a four kilowatt diesel heater and it's not a collaboration or a sponsored video. One of my friends owns a van conversion company and he's loaned me this Autotherm 4D so I can take it apart, have a look, review it, as well as the new Autotherm combi boil, which I'll be reviewing in a later video as well. So check out that one. So I want to have a look at the unit, open up the box, see what the accessories are like, take the unit apart, have a look and test it. See if it's worth the money and what sort of build quality and parts are you getting. First off, what's the price of the unit? So an Autoterm 4D is around 500 to 600 pounds supplied and that's considerably less or even less than half than it can be for some of the Espar or Webasto diesel heaters of the same output and considerably more than what the Chinese diesel heaters can be where they can be anywhere from 80 to 200 pounds. Price wise sort of middle of the field. Since I mentioned the Chinese brand and the Western brand these are their own unique design. The Chinese made diesel heater uses the expired patent of the Espar 4D and has modified it slightly over time but generally it's the exact same unit. This is its own unique design, but it's gonna be using the same principle for burning diesel in a chamber, not a copy or using the design of the Western S-Bar heaters. And since I mentioned Western S-Bar or Wabasto from Germany, or the Chinese made diesel heaters, auto terms were known as the Russian made diesel heaters. So from my understanding of having a quick look, although I think you could go further back into parent companies and so on, that auto terms were built in Russia, but they were the directors for the board of Autoterm were Ukrainian born directors. And since the current conflict, they have moved. Units are manufactured and assembled in either now Latvia or Azerbaijan. I'm here to look at the heater and not talk about politics. Right, first off, accessories as we look at most of the videos. So most people know for the Western brands, no problem with the accessories, you could fit them and they're fine. Most people know for the Chinese made diesel heaters, the accessories you come with them are pretty crap. The dreaded green hose. Some of the really terrible Jubilee clips. These screws are absolute chocolate. So let's see what the mid tier's got. Whilst it came in this big box over here, there's a few things in the bigger box that came in. So the vents, which most people are pretty used to. Ducting, now this ducting is larger than normal. So Chinese made diesel heaters, the Webassos and the Uberspatchers use 75 mil ducting. This uses 90 mil ducting uh, as a reference for, it's just a bit larger. So if you did go down this and you wanted to buy accessories, make sure they're for 90 mil ducting and they're not for 75 mil, which is what you see traditionally on the Chinese heaters. Although you can get reducers if you wanted to step it down to 75 mil. Also it comes with a nice turret plate. Um, these are often used if you're mounting them in a vehicle, you would drill out 127 millimeter hole, plonk it in and then bolt it up. However, it's quite a nice design as well. So most of the Chinese heaters come with a plate like this or maybe a turret, which is quite short. Bolt holes, exhaust intake, fuel, and then a little slot for running the cable for the fuel pump. But quite nicely on theirs, they have put a far wider hole, easier access if you wanted to, to connect the pipes on first and then slot it through. And they've also put a grommet in so you can run the pump wire slightly differently. Overall, nice bit of kit and far longer as well. So a lot of the easy ones you come with are only about 30 mil, which means it's quite hard if you've got an insulated four for that to go long enough. This on the other hand uh, goes all the way through. So nice to see that these accessories are pretty good quality. Right, what's in the box? So first off, good quality exhaust pipe with a nice end cap on it as well. If anyone's used to what comes with the Chinese models, I often recommend replacing it with this style of exhaust pipe as the Chinese ones are made from Chinesium stainless steel, which has the ability to rust pretty quickly. So decent exhaust, air filter, quite different than you see on the other ones. Pretty much open. Um, just as a quick example of what's inside. A bit different than what you might see in some other models. Although it does appear just to be a straight through. All right. Bag number one. Muffler kit and decent bracket and actual exhaust fits as well. Not the 
crap Jubilee clips you often find with Chinese heaters. Also a far more weighty muffler than you get. It does look quite similar to the ones of Chinese, which are based off the ones of the Imperspector anyway. But unlike the Chinese ones, which is a solid through and a spring, this dips down and goes round. But feels heavy. There's no drainage hole in it already for draining condensation. The manual recommends you drill your own five mil hole, depending on the orientation you want to have the muffler. Instruction manual, warranty card, and layout of the electrics. More nicer quality mounting hardware for the exhaust pipe. And it's good to see again, proper exhaust clamps. Pump and fuel line mounting kit. Pretty similar than you would use normally. Gable ties and the fuel pumps connector. Air intake mounting kit to a bracket and a normal Jubilee clip, but then you don't need to make an exhaust seal. Fuel pickup line, if you wanted to run it into your own tank, although many vehicles you can buy a sender unit, a bit like on my tank, and you can clip it directly into the auxiliary port on some modern vans or older vans uh, fuel tanks. Two mil bore hard line, so good quality fuel bore and a detachable cable, which is for your fuel pump, depending where you mount it. That's a lot of cable though. Six meters worth of fuel pump cable. The reason for the six meter fuel line is it's recommended to have only a meter of pipe between the fuel tank and the pump and then four meters afterwards. But nice to see waterproof connectors. These are detached as normal, so it's easier for you to run those through the grommet first and then clip it into the plastic, which is the actual plug itself. The main harness, fuses, terminals and a amp super seal waterproof style plug. Two fuses as they fuse both the positive and negative with 25 amp fuses each. I'm not entirely sure why both positive and negative are fused if anyone wants to enlighten me. Main communications plug. One fuel pump. It'll be interesting to see if this is any quieter than normal and definitely a different dose than your normal Chinese made fuel one, which is a 0.22 pump. And insulated sleeve for the exhaust pipe. All right, I just had to run inside to get these boxes as well. So this is one of the controllers. This is the base level controller you can get with the ortho terms, which is a simple twist power and not the comfort display, which because I'm also looking at the combi boil, it's got the new combi boil panel, which I think I can use standalone as well with the heater. Oh, this is not. And the auto term heater itself. All the different power leads on one side. Power leads, that's the main communications lead, which has the controller on it. That is a external temperature sensor lead, which is purchased separately. That is your main power lead. So that's going to be your battery or your power source to the heater. That is the fuel pump connector and this wire Label in the manual is car alarm system relay, which sounds a bit confusing, but the manual states that if you have an impulse or a continuous connection between these two wires on models from November 2019 onwards, it will turn the heater on maximum for two hours and then turn off. So kind of a remote on off switch boost button if you wanted. Air goes in, air comes out. So we will get this thing taken apart and have a look to see what's going on inside. Before we get on to this assembly unit, uh, as this is not a sponsored video and the Arctic trips do not come cheap, here is a segue to this episode's sponsor, Anchor. So, so the last year I've been looking at some of the larger Anchor power stations from the F2000, the F1200, and my new favorite power station for the van, the C1000. But for about 10 years professionally, I've been using Anchor power banks uh, in my mobile environment. So I work as an expedition leader. I lead expeditions all over the globe to remote places and I need to manage power in the field, be that jungles, deserts, or the Arctic. And I need to keep things charged. I need to keep GPS beacons, cameras, phones, torches. So over the last 10 years, I've been using two other Anchor power banks and they're getting on a bit. They've had a good run. I've also been using Anchor cables and Anchor solar panels as well. Brand I've generally been using and believing. So when they reached out to do a collaboration for the Anchor 525 power bank, I thought, why not? I like Anchor products and I like doing collaborations which help fund my Arctic adventures. First off, this is a lot smaller than my current ones and a lot newer technology in the port. USB-A and USB-C. The USB-C is both ways, so you can charge it from zero to 100%, which is 20,000 milliamps in just under seven hours, as well as fast charging my iPhone, my iPad, and charging other USB devices off the USB-A as well. So both uses IQ technology and PD technology. You can hit the power button to see how much charge currently left, and it's quite a slim line figure to fit in the pocket or around the back of my phone when I'm working. If you want to find out more about this, check out the link in the description, and let's get back to the main video. Cheers, bye. So thank you for watching that little bit. Um, 
I do use anchor equipment generally as you've seen in my work and day to life and quite often when I'm doing videos where I need to have the camera running for a long time to do disassemblies like this I will have the receiver or the phone plugged in because it's a pain in the ass when that goes flat. So generally anchor is a thing I've believed in if you want to check out their Christmas sale and their links in the description that's all down there please have a look but you also saw a little kind of idea of what I do for my professional life outside of making videos on YouTube and doing the bits all over the globe. So if you want to sort of see more about that, check out the Instagram or subscribe to the YouTube channel where these collaborations help fund what I do a little bit in my professional life overseas and more electrical projects. But back to the actual video and disassembly. Right, disassembly time. So a different clamshell to the Chinese diesel heaters. Bunch of little clips which hold the top plate on. Although, slightly more difficult to get off. Well, they don't make that easy. There's little retaining clips which have to push down. Attaching the ducting, you take off this cap and then you put on this one instead. And then the 90 mil ducting threads on to the end of there. And then same for the other end. Right, completely different style of board you see from the other ones. So people are probably more familiar with the Chinese heaters and how they look. So I brought in one of my other Chinese heaters so we can have a look. So you can see the core concept is gonna be the same. Fan spins, that sucks air in, that also sucks air into the combustion chamber on the inside of the unit. And burn chamber happens in here. These heat need fins heat up. The air is pulled over the top of the unit, across the heat exchanger, out the end. But we'll get this aside, we'll look at this heater. Similar gasket design as you have on the Chinese heaters and all the other ones. Interesting to see the way that the PCB is protected. We're just sitting there out in the open with plugs and a few different bits and bobs covering it. And this thing you also notice is one, you can see it's been balanced and two, it's cogging because the auto terms use an induction based motor or a brushless motor. So you don't have any issues with brushes wearing out and clogging bearings. A bit like on, on like the Chinese heaters and most of the Western heaters by West uh, Espel and Webasto also use brushed motors, whilst this is a uh, induction based. And that's also probably why the PCB is mounted further back. A lot of the other air heater designs have a Hall effect sensor on the PCB, which lines up with some magnets on the fan. So then the PCB can use a Hall effect sensor to figure out fan speed, which is obviously quite important to the combustion. This can be a bit further away because it doesn't need to do that. First, take a few photos because I don't want to put any wires in the wrong place. Look here, there's also two temperature sensors I can see at the minute. One based at the very end and one based on there which is visible from the exhaust. One visible in the exhaust and that usually is a flame out sensor. I guess first bits first, let's get this middle section off. Index plug, so you can't plug the glow plug in the wrong way. Since these are glued shut on here, I'm gonna probably take off the PCB and so I don't have to disconnect the wires. So we'll take that one off. All right, PCB removed. Although there was glue on the end of it, you just put a screwdriver in it and it allowed you to undo it. Although it's probably just stopped in them coming out by accident. Talk a bit. Right, motor unit. You can see the internal fan blades are balanced, although they've done it in a far less crude way than some of the Chinese ones, which just snap chunks of plastic off. And yeah, you can feel the cogging on the induction motor. The whole unit as well, casting wise, is really quite nice. And it's also not one singular cast as a fin heat exchanger, which is slightly different. But overall, here's what the ones from a Chinese heater based off the Uber Spatches look like. Well, I kind of want to see what's behind this door. So let's see the back of the burn chamber. We'll get that out in a minute anyway. That is a huge burn chamber versus uh, what you'd be seeing in a Webasto Vespatcher or Chinese made one. And that's the back of the burn chamber. A quick side by side comparison of all the component parts. Well, for starters, this is a burn chamber from a Chinese made heater, um, similar to the design in the S-bars. And there is a comparison of the burn chamber differences. 
We looked at the motor assembly for the auto term. This is a motor assembly for a normal Chinese one. You can see there, you've got these little magnetic bits and it just free moves and bearings. Those magnetic bits are for the Hall effect sensor to know motor speed. And whilst we've already covered on this one, this uses a brushless motor. So you've got the cogging, you can see there, and it doesn't need those marks because it can monitor the motor speed in a different way. Cogging does still occur on brushed motors, it's just usually more pronounced on brushless motors. Although there is the blue and green wire which plugs into the motor housing area. So there may be a more local hall effect center and not built on the main board. The schematic here shows one of them is PWM, which is usually motor speed, and one of them is getting revolution data from somewhere. Someone enlighten me if you know there's a Hall Effect Center elsewhere or how it gets revolutions. So a Chinese heat exchanger versus the Autoturn one. This is substantially heavier uh, and a lot thicker. This is a singular cast unit they use on this model. These models, again, it's a cast piece, but it looks like it's cast circular. It's classed as a cylinder, and then it's got a extra finned heat exchanger it's two different metals sort of clamped permanently around it. Maybe just easier manufacturing. Although this is the board which comes with the auto term. This is one of my examples of a Chinese board. And there's also, I've got other Chinese board covers which look a bit like this, which are a bit more sealed and weather sealed. This one isn't a weather sealed board. However, some of my other ones do use the weather sealed boards which have got waterproof plugs. This isn't a weather sealed board. So you might want to reconsider if you wanted to mount the Autoterm external to a vehicle. However, Autoterm do sell external mounting boxes for the heaters, which would give it the protection needed. The burn chamber does come apart from here. And we're going to take out the glow plug and have a look at that. Although this glow plug is a 17 size spanner. Quite a little diddy glow plug. That's your glow plug on a Chinese heater and the, and the SPAR ones. That's got a little grommet on the wire. This on the other hand has got a little seal there. And the fig configuration is pretty similar as well. Diesel is sprayed onto an atomizer via the fuel line, spreads over the atomizer's mesh, and then the glow plug ignites it, burns then into the chamber there. And whilst that's happening, the air from the fan is getting sucked in and blown through there alongside the diesel. Well, having now had it disassembled, I mean, my main thing I would note is, is it's a high quality heater and it is chunky. It's robust. Chinese made heater or the Robasto copy, far lighter weight, but you would expect that that's a quarter of the price or less than this. But very unique design, as you can see, um, using brushless motors, which means you don't have the issue of worn brushes and those clogging up your bearings or you're wearing the brushes using inductive motors or brushless motors. Burn chamber is a lot larger. Not that I'm saying that makes much difference. Um, it's just a different design. The main thing to take away is this unit is just substantially heavier and thicker and more robust than how it's been constructed. I would say that I was quite surprised at how the ECU is protected. I would have thought it would have used, it would have been in case and used waterproof plugs much like some of the other heaters I've played with. So if you want to mount this external, which I think some people do mount these external under vehicles, um, I think auto term do sell a enclosure for it to go under mounted because that's not particularly water sealed. But that's also may not necessarily be a use case it's designed to be in. The castings themselves are really nice. Sometimes on some of the Chinese ones, you see some poor quality castings with flashes left over and feeling quite lightweight. This just feels heavy and all the casting is pretty well cleaned up. As for parts, auto term heaters are pretty popular in many of the European countries as well. So it's not too difficult to source parts. So I guess the next bit is to reassemble it all and put it back together. Help a bit of having um, photographs of the wiring. Although I realised I didn't have to check too far because they actually mark the black is for the ground on all the connectors. That's the heater back together and it's a really nicely made heater. So next step is testing. Right, well, welcome to my wonderful test bench. Set up indoors, always great for a diesel heater, although I have got a vent window here with the exhaust going out and then I've got the van's max fan turn on which so it's sucking air in from the roof so all air is getting pushed out. Wouldn't recommend installing it like this permanently. That's an AC to DC 12 volt power supply running off the power station so we can have a look at the wattage it takes when it's starting. I've primed the system so the diesel should be up there and lighting first time now. Installing it, use the insulation on the exhaust pipe. Haven't currently got the muffler on, we'll play with that a little, little bit. That's the air intake, normally that should be outside as well. So this is the controller which it can come with, is a simple one, rotary dial. Unlike Chinese diesel heaters, you have a ventilation mode so you can just have the fan running or you can have the heat running. And then this one is very simple to use, you just twiddle the dial. 
and ventilation's going. Turn it up to max. It's blowing, take my word for it. Turn it down, minimum. Turn it off again. Right, very simple controller. You can use this for heating. You, obviously you can use it on thermostat modes. You can use it on fixed power modes. And you can go through settings in a slightly complicated way. And you can get error codes by the flashing of the LEDs. That's very simple though, but we're gonna put on the Boil comfort controller itself. So this one is not the smart comfort. This is the newer one, which also supports the combi boil, which is the hot water stuff, which we'll look at in a different video. And this is the new controller. So currently 16 degrees. The, from my understanding, this is the temperature sensor, unless you plug in the external temperature sensor, which can be on the heater. You've also got water temperature. I haven't currently got the water temperature sensor plugged in, but that will go on the combi boil. And then you have a bit more access to a few other bits and bobs. So temperature mode, thermostat mode, heat plus ventilation, power. You can find the manuals online for what you can do on these units, but let's get it on heating mode. Heating and let's turn it on for my tests. Power mode, let's crank it up to full. And there we go, it's gonna automatically turn on for 30 minutes. So power consumption is gonna be an important one for booting up normally, for example, the Chinese diesel heaters use around 130 watts when they're turning on. Currently on 65 watts and the glow plug will be heating up at the moment. And the first clicks of the fuel pump. It is a lot noisier than it should be at the minute as the diesel hasn't gone all the way through the pump yet into the heater. 66 watts still, 70 watts, 73 watts. I can start to hear the noise of ignition. Right, heater is currently pulling 90 watts. I'd say that was actually a failed start. To be expected though, or the first time setting up the unit as diesel hasn't quite reached the burn timber just yet. Second restart going. Almost didn't notice it because I couldn't hear the uh, fuel pipe. So it's still pulling 60 watt. Uh, it's starting to kick out hot air now. And that's, sounds like it's ignited. See that it's caught and now it's veering up to full power. And there we go. Running out full power mode, it's currently pulling 50 watt. Maybe not necessarily the best test, but no exhaust. currently 32 degrees in here, so let's turn it off. Or oh, 32 degrees on the other thermometer over there. I don't actually know how to turn it off. Uh, oh wait. I would say the shutdown process and cooling down process does take quite a while. Right, something I wanted to quickly test was because this pulled under 100 watt, about 70 watt to turn on, I wonder if you could start it directly with a 12 volt socket uh, via power stations. Some people might not know that most people can't run a Chinese diesel heater off these because Chinese diesel heaters pull about 130 watt out of the 12 volt sockets. Um, and usually these are only rated to eight or 10 amp, which means you can't start them. But this on the other hand is less, so it should start directly off 12 volt. Powering on, 13.4 volt. Let's just put it on power mode. All right, that seems good so far. No, nope. that seems to kill it. Oh, let's try it on one of my other power stations instead. This one is still going. Fuel pump's going. Well, it sounds like it's ignited. It seems like it is dropping the voltage quite a lot down to 12.5, which is probably 11.5, which is probably quite near the low voltage shutoff for the unit. Yep, glow pergo's gone out and it's dropped down to 18 watts. So 
it runs off the 12 volt socket on my EcoFlow, but not the anchor one. Currently cranking up. Right, so no issues running it off the power station, so we can shut it down. Uh, it did drop a little bit though, under voltage, which is not surprising since it's pretty near max what the air. Uh, so the reason there's an under voltage warning on shutdown is the glow plug comes on and then the fan has gone up to maximum to help cool the unit down on startup. The glow plug's on, but the fan's on low for the start. So that's why there wasn't an under voltage issue there. So it does seem you still really can't run a diesel heater off the 12 volt socket on most of the newer models of power station. One of my older models does have a slightly more powerful 12 volt socket. It, so, and I've ran auto terms off it before without issue. But a lot of the newer models over the last sort of two years usually trip or have issues trying to run a diesel heater directly. So I'll go back to using the test bench, which I do for the, with the charger. Just tried it on the other one again. This one, you kind of kind of hear the motor, it just, which it doesn't sound like it's getting enough power just to start moving, which I guess would increase the amps and potentially be too much for the socket. Right, I just wanted to do another test to see if I could figure out why one works, not the other, not the overall wattage. Uh, I'm not seeing a big amp draw on there, but it could well be the inductive load of the motor starting is just too much for however power, this power station drops down its higher DC cell voltage to a 12 volt output. And that is triggering the, the safety on that whilst it's not triggering the shutdown on the EcoFlow ones, which makes sense, they're different companies. Oh. And you can see what's happened there is it's just turned off with the power on, which is not good at all. That's not very good at all. Well, since it had a shutdown there where it was too hot and is now and had to cool itself down, which is not great for the boards because you melt stuff, it's now kicked back in because it's got power back on again to help cool itself down. So pretty much it borderline works, not doesn't really work effectively or safely for the unit or for the power station because that was stressing that out. Next up is going to be testing the heater but using it on its automated modes. So this you've got a temperature mode, power mode, heat and ventilation and thermostat mode. Thermostat mode gets the target temperature it turns off and then reignites when the temperature drops. Temperature mode gets the target temperature and tries to maintain it. Right, heat is ignited. Now let's just see how well this works. So it's a bit difficult to show in a video how the thermostat works. Temperature mode, you set your target temperature, the heater will get you there and then start to dial back to maintain that temperature, opposed to quite often on the Chinese diesel heaters or their thermostat modes are a bit terrible and it, the heater will only do maximum or minimum. I use a afterburner, which is a replacement controller for my Chinese diesel heater, which means I've got a perfect thermostat where it varies the pump speed and fan speed to maintain your set temperature that the temperature mode in this is trying to do the same and then if you are getting too hot because even a four kilowatt diesel heater in a large van like this on low can be too much heat it will turn the heater off if it overshoots it by a little bit and then when it starts to cool down again turn the heat back on again as for fuel consumption there's statistics on the on the website for how much it would use going at max it's probably also worth saying that the auto term heaters do reach a bunch of different regulations and conformities of which i'm sure you can go on their website and have a look at which would allow them to be fitted in used in different environments where you may not necessarily be able to use a Chinese heater. They've also got a good warranty and customer support as well. If you like this sort of content, consider subscribing to the channel or the Instagram as well, where you can follow some of the trips or projects like this or the Arctic trip when it's more live and up to date. I would say this brings me to the end of the video. This heater is great. Yes, it is. It's around a five, 600 pound heater. It's a lot more expensive than your Chinese ones and a lot cheaper than the other Western brands. But the build quality, having played with and dismantled Webastos and Uberspectres as well, I would say the build quality is comparable to the Western German runs. Don't see any issues there. The pump is extremely quiet. It's got a really great user interface. I really quite like how modern it looks and it works well. And a thermostat which functions well. So overall, I think it's a great unit. I'm not gonna replace my current Chinese diesel heater with the afterburner controller, mainly because this is not mine. So I've got to give it back. If you do want to check out some of the other videos on the channel, I've got a lot of other videos about the Chinese diesel heaters. And to be fair, I think Chinese diesel heaters are really great value for money. I would give you some sort of discount code or affiliate link for auto term, but I have no affiliation with them, so I can't. Um, but I'm sure you can find some somewhere. Next time, I'm going to be looking at the auto term's new combi boil, which integrates with this unit. So have a look out for that. And thank you very much. And I'll see you next time. Cheers. Bye.